All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, first UVic Cafe Sci presentation of our 2020-2021 season, fully online, as I'm sure all of you are used to by now. Um, we're going to have a wonderful year. We, we proved that this uh, platform can uh, succeed and thrive over the summer, and so we're looking forward to a great range of talks coming to you over uh, basically the next six or seven months. My name is John Willis. I'll be your host for this evening. I'm a professor in physics and astronomy and uh, before I uh, introduce this evening's speaker let me just give a little bit of an introduction to those of you who might be uh, unfamiliar with our format or returning so Cafe Scientifique uh, basically welcomes uh, science researchers from all over UVic to bring their uh, their knowledge their experience their passion to to you as the interested public uh, this is our first full season online, but we, uh, we uh, developed our online platform and our, our presentations for you over the summer. So if you're here, you know how to connect. It's all of your friends who are fruitlessly trying to connect at the moment that I need to speak to. So uh, Blackboard is a great platform, um, very straightforward, very simple. And uh, what I would mention as well is if you ever miss our talks and uh, want to actually see it again, perhaps, all of our talks are archived on YouTube. All you need to search for is UVic Cafe Sci, and that will take you to our talk from over the summer and every talk we give from now on. So um, I think just a quick note about online etiquette. Uh, actually, you don't have to worry at all about muting your microphone. I've done that for you. Uh, once I finish introducing the talk, um, our speaker will speak for about 40, 45 minutes this evening. And then we'll, um, around about 6.50, 10 to 7, we'll um, stop the presentation. And then we'll have an opportunity to engage with you as the audience via the chat window if you want to write down any questions. And then Toby and I will work through and answer those questions um, for you. So uh, I think without further ado, let me then introduce this evening's speaker. Our speaker is Tobias Junginger, who is a relatively new assistant professor in physics and astronomy at UVic. He also has a joint appointment with an organization called Triumph, which is based in Vancouver. And this is uh, Canada's National Particle Accelerator Facility. It's a wonderful concentration of knowledge and expertise. And so Tobias, Toby, is going to tell us this evening about how particle accelerators have changed our world and our understanding of it. All your Toby. Okay, thank you, John, for the introduction. So yes, today I'd like to talk about how particle accelerators have changed our world and, um, well, the way we understand it, what we know about it. So um, it's really a great pleasure to finally give this talk, even so it's online. It was originally scheduled for January this year, but then something happened. Then we have rescheduled for April, and then something else happened. OK, so in this talk, I mean, I will show with particle accelerators. We cannot do anything about the weather, but we can certainly do something about um, uh, COVID-19. I have two examples um, uh, in this talk where um, accelerator labs or particle accelerators themselves contributed to the fight against COVID-19. But now let um, uh, me start off um, uh, with a little bit of brainstorming here. So I'd like you now to think about what do you think our particle accelerator is good for? And as a second question is, where is the closest one from us right now? So um, the closest one to, uh, to us is probably one of these things. So the older generation, like myself, probably have seen such a thing or had it in their, had it in their homes. This is essentially a particle accelerator. These are called CRT monitors. So what does CRT stand for? Cathode ray tube. All right, so it's an electron accelerator. Why don't we call it this way? Why we call it a cathode ray tube? Because the fact is, the, um, when the cathode ray tube was invented, nobody knew that the electrons existed. So it's actually an electron accelerator, which is older than the knowledge of the existence of the electron. But if we have a closer look into such a device, we will see there are many parts also are found in any modern particle accelerator. First of all, we have an electron source, then we have uh, a wall accelerated, we have magnets to focus it, and finally, the image is created 
created by deflecting the electron beam along the screen in two directions with a magnet. So these are all components which you find in modern particle accelerators. However, the cathode ray tube has a history which goes far beyond, um, like in time, before actually television was a thing. Television basically became a thing after World War II. Okay, there was some broadcasting before, but mainly it became um, a very common thing after World War II. But already in 1897, cathode ray tubes have really um, played a, um, a very important role how we, under, how we understand nature itself. So for basic physics experiments. So a guy called Thompson in 1897 used the cathode ray tube for experiments in which he found out um, uh, that the cathode ray itself must come from a metal plate. He exchanged the plate for several months and he always found like, okay, he always got this cathode ray out there. And he thought like, okay, fine. So therefore it must come from that metal plate. And then by using either um, an electric field through charged metal plates or magnets, he could, he could see how that beam was deflected. And just the way it was deflected and that for a given voltage and putting all that together he, and taking in the knowledge about the atom. We had already knowledge about the atom before 1897. So we knew already about um, uh, what size it should be found out that these cathode rays, which must be negatively charged, must be smaller than an actual, than an actual atom. And so he came up with um, his atom model, which is called the plum pudding model. So he's a British physicist, so plum pudding is a thing there. And that's how he thought, how he envisioned his atomic model. So he thinks about it, that there is the atom itself, and in it, um, there must be these small negative charges in there, right? So um, why does it have to be like negative and positive charges? Obviously, we know that matter itself is neutral. So therefore, what he gets there must be smaller than the atom. And this is what he came up then with that in this model. However, nowadays, we know that this is not the full story. Nowadays, we know that the atom is far more complicated than that. And particle accelerators have played a incremental role, have a fundamental role in understanding the matter on a smaller and smaller length scale. And how that works, you kind of have to think about a particle accelerator as a, as a microscope in that sense. And yeah, I have here an equation here. So in undergraduate physics, we learn that the language of physics is mathematics. And so I have to go a little bit, even a public talk, I have to use a little bit of mathematics to bring, to bring things over here. I have, but I've, here is De Bruyne's equation. And what you see there is on the left hand side of that equation is the wavelengths. And you can always think about in a way that whatever you want to see with any, um, with any wave, the wave has to be on the same order as the object you want to probe. This is kind of a fundamental limitation, what you can do with an optical microscope. So you can, some people have um, heard that when you go for UV light instead of, which is higher energetic than optical light, that you can look at smaller length scales. And then also another thing which we have to um, understand here is that the dualism between wave and turn. So some people have heard maybe about that uh, light can be considered as a particle, a phonon. And the other way, it works also vice versa. So if you have an electron, an electron can be seen as a wave. And if I look now at the equation I have here, I have the wavelengths on the left-hand side, and then I have on the right side, I have h, which is just a constant right now. Don't worry about that. But then I have and the denominator, I have the momentum. The momentum is related to my speed of the particle. So that means basically I put in, I put in more and more and more energy in the particle, it gets faster and faster, gets more momentum, and then I have that on the bottom, on the right side of my equation. So if my speed becomes larger, 
my wavelengths and therefore the object I'm able to probe becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And there we use the length scale, we use the scale which is electron volts. An electron volt is simply, um, I take an electron and I let it run through a volt to one, um, through a potential difference of one volt, then I have an energy of one electron volt. So let's think about, you have a small battery, okay, that come usually 1.5 volts, and then you attach a plate to both sides of that, and then if you are able an electron from one side to the other, you have an energy gain of one electron volt. Now this is basically a very simple particle accelerator. But if you want to look at um, the size of the nucleus, so start here, we have here the length scale. So an atom is about um, 10 to the 10 meter, that means a tenth of a nanometer, or basically a tenth of a millionth of a millimeter. That's about the scales we are looking for. At that, if we go for higher and higher energies, we see that also the nucleus, which is again uh, 100,000 times smaller, uh, excuse me, 10, about 10,000 times um, uh, smaller, uh, has also again a substructure. And I okay, care that we, the deeper we want to look into the nucleus, into our matter, the more energy we need. So if you want to look at the nucleus, which you see at the picture in the middle, we need mega electron volt, mega one million. So in the end, if I would do that with like um, small batteries here, okay, I would put in a, um, a million batteries after each other. And then I could, um, uh, if I would be able to run my electrons through there, then I would be able to probe um, the core of the nucleus. Obviously, that's not a very practical approach. And so with particle accelerators, we have come with other I, with other technologies, other techniques to bring our particles up to these energies. So um, here we go like um, GeV, this is 10 to the 9, so basically a thousand times a million. And like the highest energetic um, uh, accelerators, this is tera electron volts, which is basically a million times a million. And this is be the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. I will talk about that towards the end of my talk. So, but now let's come back and look where is the next closest particle accelerator located to us. So let's just assume we were sitting here at Hermann's Jazz Club. All right, so obviously we're not, but um, let's just pretend everything is like um, uh, it used to be in March. So in that case, we would have to uh, walk 3.2 kilometers, it would take us 40 minutes, and then we would be here at the BC Cancer Clinic, and there they have several particle accelerators actually. So this one is what we call a linear accelerator, is an electron accelerator um, which is used to irradiate tumors. So on the end of the day, what we will be using here is the capability of particle accelerators to produce um, energy to transform energy in a very small spot, the tumor, and not affecting the surrounding healthy tissue, so that we have like a localized way to kill tumors. This is not the only accelerator which they have at the BC Cancer. So just in July 2019, which was actually the same month where I started at UVic, a new particle accelerator came to um, uh, came to Victoria. It has nothing to do with me. It's a total coincidence. I found out later when I was um, preparing for that talk that actually happened in the same month. But okay, this is another another accelerator here which I have now at um, the BC Cantor um, Hospital, and this has a different purpose. So this is also a branch of the nuclear medicine. But what they are using this accelerator for is they are, um, well, they are producing medical isotopes. So medical isotopes, like how it works, in the end you have to think about nature always works in a way that it wants to minimize energy. And if we can use a particle accelerator to irradiate substance and that, um, that substance goes to what we call excited state. So it is, it is more energetic. But this 
state is not like the natural state in which the um, in which the atom wants to be. Yeah. So it will at some point decay to the ground state, we call it, to so the lowest energy. This is always how nature works. All nature wants to minimize energy. And the way to go there is by um, a radioactive decay. So we excite the particle by putting energy from the particle accelerator. And then what do we create from here? This is like, um, yeah, um, these are radionuclei, we call them. So, and these can be then injected into, into a patient, and then, the, and then it will sort of decay inside of the patient, and the signal can then be, um, and can then be looked at by, looked at by um, a camera, as you see on the top of that picture. So at the end of the day, it's, a bit, it's an technique, a bit like comparable to um, uh, classical um, uh, X-ray or um, MRT, but you have to kind of think that the source where it's being created is inside your body. So you can think it in a way like, um, yeah, the, the most straightforward thing you can think about that it will that it will monitor their blood flow. So wherever your blood flows is there, we will have a source of that radiation which is kind of connected when the patient is going through the detector. And this is really a very um, nowadays well used technique in um, a cancer in cancer treatment, so that you know exactly where your tumors are, um, are located. So the type of accelerator which they use for that, this is a cyclotron. So here I have a slide which is um, full of text, but I like to read it out to you because okay, it's just like. Um, straight copy paste it from the Guinness Book of World Records. It doesn't mean I endorse the Guinness Book of World Records here, but this is a different story. But I just like to read it out for you. So cyclotrons are a type of particle accelerator in which charged particles, such as protons, so basically, okay, we're looking at heavier part here. So this is type one part of um, what's in the nucleus. In the direct irradiation, as you saw in the accelerator before, we use electrons are accelerating using a high frequency alternating voltage. There's also one major difference here than using stacking one battery after the other and using your alternating voltages. The particles move in a spiral, so they meet the same accelerating voltage numerous times. It's just a way to make it very efficient that you don't have to stack basically out after the other. So the largest is the 80 meter diameter machine at Triumph, the Canadian lab for particle accelerator and uh, for particle and nuclear physics. The protons inside this cyclotron travel 45 kilometer as they spiral outwards, gradually reaching the maximum energy of 520 mega electron volts, so basically 520 million batteries equivalent. You want to talk about that picture? The Triumph cyclotron has been in operation since 19744. Where is it located? Is this here? So this is a, an image of uh, UBC, and you see the airport on the south and Vancouver on the upper right. So we are there located on the south end of the UBC campus. Um, yeah. And this is how the cyclotron, how the cyclotron looks like. On the left side, you see the Triumph cyclotron during during um, uh, when it was built. While on the right side, this is a more recent picture where um, somebody is inside the open cyclotron for maintenance. So the story of the cyclotron, however, goes back than um, than um, the in 1974. So the first cyclotrons were built in in 1930. And they are 1930s, and these are actually one of the very first particle accelerators ever built. If we discount here you know, the um, uh, cathode ray tube, so on the um, picture on the bottom, you see an uh, um, a cyclotron, which is one of the is one of the very first ones. So, Triumph is the center of particle accelerators of Canada. So it has many other and many other accelerators nowadays. Uh, with different purposes, which you don't really um, uh, like to go into detail. But what I like to show you here is the um, the vast variety and how different the 
these accelerators can can look like. So what partly comes here um, directly or directly spots the eye might be that we have here different two different colors in a way. So on the left side, you see these are um, look uh, copper accelerators, and on the right side, you see something which is like more like a um, uh, metal aluminium, right? So these are two main branches. So on the left, um, these copper accelerators. Okay, these are normal conducting machines. While the uh, like the metal is actually a superconductor, it's niobium. As the field of my research, so these are accelerators which are on the one hand very efficient, so but on the other hand rather complicated. If you look on the on the right hand side of this image, you see how the full accelerators look like. So they require um, uh, cooling to minus 27 degrees Celsius. And um, I mean, I could go on talking about um, all these different accelerators and so on, but. I encourage you when this pandemic is over, take a trip over to um, Vancouver and have a tour of the lab. And there you will um, uh, see, depending on what is right now, whether they are in the shutdown or the accelerator is open. But there's quite um, uh, quite a bit to see and um, uh, to learn when you visit, um, when you have the chance to, to visit Triumph one day, hopefully in the near future. And here is the newest machine being built at Triumph. And that doesn't really look like a particle accelerator for one simple reason, it's not. So this one is um, the Mechanical Ventilator Milano, which is a low-cost ventilator, which the lab has been built in collaboration with uh, many other scientific institutes um, all over the world to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. So I, without going too much into detail here, I just wanted to highlight here that the expertise that is available at um, a research lab like Triumph and Accelerator Lab can also be used um, for other purposes. And in case of such a pandemic, um, uh, the um, laboratory was, uh, was able to make this, con um, this contribution to build this um, uh, uh, ventilator. But now let's go a little bit back and think about what science is um, Triumph doing. To be, well, it's rather a broad program, and um, there are also um, aspects in, um, uh, in medical science, and there are aspects in material science. But I think um, it's fair to say that the main focus of the lab is in, um, nuclear science. And nuclear science, in that case, it doesn't mean that we are um, building um, nuclear, uh, nuclear power plants or anything like that. No, it's really about understanding the nucleus itself. So why are we doing that? So the, well, the main scientific question was, um, why do we have like um, uh, 118 elements on Earth? I mean, not all of them are stable, but we have like, um, yeah, um, we have to really look how many would be stable, but um, uh, probably like about 100 stable elements on Earth. And if you think about how they are being created, so think about, um, any star. So the star basically creates energy by fusing hydrogen into helium. Why does this work? It's simply um, because the helium ath um, at um, atom is lighter than two hydrogen atoms. So if I put them together, I gain energy. And that's what nature wants to do. Always nature wants to minimize energy. So it is energetically favorable to create helium out of two hydrogen atoms. And that you, um, process you can take on and on and on theoretically until you arrive at the 26th element, iron, which is the most stable. But we got a lot more. So why do we have cop um, uh, um, cobalt, nickel, copper, zinc, gallium, and so on on Earth? So right, just from these consideration, you would not understand um, why you would have that. And to understand this, you have to look into processes which happening, which are happening in um, exploding stars. And to do the experiments, which basically resemble that, we can't have an exploding star here, we use particle accelerators to create, um, uh, to create elements which are then, uh, which are um, not stable, and then the decay products end up then with some of the other stable um, uh, elements again. 
This is basically what the science of triumph is about in a nutshell. So, but triumph has um, not the highest energetic, uh, the highest energy accelerator in Canada. There is another institute, which is the Canadian Light Source, which is located in Saskatoon. So this Canadian Light Source um, uh, is um, opened in 2004. So here you can see that's about the size of a football field. You see two rings in there. So the inner ring is basically it's the actual accelerator, if you will. So, so where you accelerate electrons and then you bring them to the outer ring. And the outer ring, in that ring, the electrons don't gain energy. They're kept at the same energy all the time. So what's the point? So we have found out um, uh, that when an, an electron is going through a band, it, it radiates. So that is really um, something you don't like when you do um, fundamental physics experiments where you want them to bring to collision and then create new particles and so on. I can talk a little bit about later when we talk about the LHC towards the end. But it turned out that that radiation, called synchrotron radiation, because just named after the type of accelerator we use here, can be quite useful. Because it is like, um, it can be used as a very bright X-ray source. So it has a very, um, defined energy and um, uh, can be um, yeah it can be very well suited to to study matter molecules more yeah so in a way you can think about in here the size of a of, of, um, of a um, uh, soccer field or football field um, as a very yeah as a very fancy X-ray machine okay so what can you do with that? You can look. Um, you can look so much into matter that you um, find um, uh, it can find the structure of macromolecules. So this one is on In that case, it's just taken them uh, simply from Wikipedia. But there can be many other um, uh, molecules you can look in, or even looking at looking into reactions. So this Canadian light source is well. I mean, it's it's a one of a kind machine, but that doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of comparable accelerators worldwide. So, like um, many of uh, many countries um, uh, have such light sources. Um, some of them even several ones, like larger countries. So they are kind of like um, distributed all over the world, and they have become a standard research tool to uh, for molecular biologists. So I'm um, talking here a bit about COVID-19 again. So it took one month after um, uh, COVID-19 was discovered until we had the molecular structure. And so it's out of my field, but I can only cite what the experts from that, say, um, from that um, area say. And they say, like, 10 years ago, it would not have taken one month. It would have taken us a year. I think it's a fair, um, it's probably a, um, a fair estimate. If you look, it took um, uh, four years to get the same level of um, knowledge about um, HIV, which took us one month to get to that point um, uh, um, in case of COVID-19. So without going too much into detail, um, I um, uh, like just to point out there that um, there are several experiments where the Canadian light source, short CLS, is contributing to the fight um, against COVID-19. And just have a look here at um, hashtag CLS versus COVID. But now, let me come to the largest particle accelerator which has ever been built. And for that, we have to leave, um, uh, we have to leave Canada and uh, travel to Geneva. And this one is um, the Large Hadron Collider, which is um, uh, a ring which is a circ circumference of 27 kilometers and uh, the particles actually um, travel between France and um, uh, Switzerland so they go over the border um, every um, yeah, every fraction of a second so in, in each circumference and what is what we what um, uh, is done there is we are looking here at um, uh, basically what happened at the very beginning of the universe, the Big Bang. So the idea is to recreate 
what has been happening at the very first moments after the creation of the universe. This is just like um, um, a picture where you are inside the tunnel. So it's about a hundred meter um, underground, just to um, yeah, just to keep things safe from the radiation which is produced in the experiment. And what you see here are a couple of magnets. So the challenging part about that machine is to keep the to keep the particles on that um, yeah, on that circumference of which is for their energy small of 27 kilometers. So not hard to to re, to accelerate them. But uh, okay, certainly. I mean, it's also an um, yeah, it's certainly not um, a trivial. But like technologically, from the technology of that machine, the more difficult part is to keep them on to keep them on track so that they basically come back after each turn. And for that, you need a lot of these um, superconducting high field magnets. And you see, it's basically one magnet after each other. The full 27 kilometers is basically full of magnets, which is just a little part where we do the actual acceleration. So what is the science um, they're doing there about? And for that, I going to present you here another formula. This is, I guess this is the most famous formula which there is in physics, E equals mc squared. What does it mean? So on the left-hand side of that equation, we got the energy. And on the right-hand side, m is the mass of the particle. And c squared, OK, this is, again, simply just a constant. But this equation tells us that energy and mass are equivalent, and they can be basically transferred one into the other. And this is what happened in the early universe. There was such a high energy density that particles could always be created and they would annihilate, going back to energy and going back and forth. But then our universe has expanded and we don't have these huge energy densities anymore. And so we have only very, very few particles left. In the end, okay, electrons, um, uh, protons, and neutrons. But in the early on universe, there were a lot more particles. And by and increasing the energy further and further in particle accelerators, we are basically looking back in time. And this is what um, was discovery about the Higgs boson about. We went as far back as when the Higgs boson still existed and could constantly be produced out of energy. So that means, okay, the heavier my particle, the more energy I have to pump in to recreate it. This is what basically particle physics is about. Okay, so I come here almost to the end. So I have shown you um, particle accelerators in our close vicinity. And then we have traveled over to Vancouver to Triumph. And then um, we have traveled to Saskatoon to look at the Canadian light source, to finally end up in Geneva and to see where the larger particle accelerator is. But these are just a very few of the particle accelerators which are which exist worldwide, because most of the particle accelerators are actually used in industry. And this is just like to give you an overview uh, what they are used for. The so most is for wires and cables in a process called cross-linking or um, uh, for coatings, adhesives, paint, skin, cause surface, surface curing. At the end, this is all electron accelerators what is being used there. And the idea here is that it's just a way to, um, to implement um, large amounts of energy in a small spot. And wherever this needs a particle accelerator is a good way to, to provide that. Finally, there is um, another application this is in security. Again, this goes to the creation of, uh, of X-rays. And particle accelerators can be used for cargo scanning. So here the, on the top, you see a truck. You shine through, and then you look if there's really in there what is supposed to be in there, or um, uh, here on the bottom to look at shipping containers. Okay, so that's already um, uh, the end of my talk. I hope I could give you an understanding what we are particle accelerators, what we use them for, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. All right, that was a wonderful presentation, Toby. Thank you very much. Um, 
What we, we have uh, a couple of traditions um, here at uh, our online Cafe Sai, and one is the virtual round of applause. So to all of the participants, if you, if you have a moment, we all just raise our hands in a kind of a virtual round of applause for our, our speaker this evening to say thank you. Thank you very much, guys. And um, what I would say is to all of the participants, if you uh, would like to ask a question, um, what I would suggest is let's use the chat window. So to actually find the chat window, some of you will see on your little browser window in the bottom right, there's a little magenta tab with a couple of arrows in it. If you click on that, it opens up a side panel for you. And then there's a little speech bubble at the bottom left of that open panel. And that's where you can actually type in your question. And just hitting return means we'll see it on the screen. So what I would say is if any of you have any questions and would like to ask it, please start typing away now. And uh, I guess, Toby, I was going to ask, um, well, it's not a loaded question, but you've talked about how um, particle accelerators have become bigger and bigger and bigger and they're doing different science, right? Do we need a bigger one? Are there, are there well, <laughs> that's a good question, yes. Um, do we need a bigger one? Um, many people believe so. And if you ask um, people at CERN, they would tell you that the next thing will be our 100 kilometer um, rain. So if you look at the history of CERN, so it didn't start with the 27 kilometer accelerator, but they always built in um, built a newer one. So they become bigger and bigger every time. And so and all the accelerators they have built before became then injectors for um, uh, the for the newest one. Because you think about it, you have a 27 kilometer accelerator, you cannot start immediately with a particle which is at rest. So you have to basically go through several um, uh, to several accelerating stage, a bit like using different gears in a way, um, a little bit of, of oh, um, yeah. slightly hand waving comparison. But yeah, and if you want to go like to the next um, step, you want to go new discoveries. If there are yeah, you would need bigger ones. However, there are also other approaches where um, people are using um, different ways to accelerate particles, where you can potentially make them more compact but these technologies are not um, as advanced yet so that that we can get um, a high um, luminosity what we call basically power we don't get a lot of particles in these um, uh, accelerators based on new concepts okay cool so still waiting for any questions if you have them please feel free to type away um i guess this is this is where i get a, a captive speaker now i will ask all of my questions to you so we talked about do we need a bigger one, but I guess I could actually see there must be a lot of um, potential applications for miniaturizing particle accelerators. Do you, do you see much of a trend of, of that going on as well? Many, okay. That, um, okay, so uh, which way should I go with that? <laughs> so I talked a little bit about these superconducting accelerators, yeah? Yeah. Uh, so you can see those copper one, and you saw the superconducting, the niobium ones. And these uh, niobium ones, you said, I told them they are rather um, complicated devices from the cooling and so on. And especially yeah. like in the cryogenics, we had um, many, we had big advances, advances in the last decade or, two or so. And so nowadays, like with our advances in that technology and the advances in the cryogenic, we are at a stage where we can be able to bring these um, uh, highly efficient accelerators to um, industrial applications. Right. So, um, so basically making industrial accelerators um, uh, more efficient or, or even opening ways where it was, uh, which, um, for applications which were not possible so far. OK. Yeah. And do you see, I mean, I don't know how fortunate we are in Victoria with the great technology that we have at the BC Cancer Agency, right? Is there a hope that um, essentially as we're able to miniaturize or um, miniaturize accelerators or perhaps even make them more affordable, right, that we can basically expand that kind of cancer treatment options to countries that might not have had the resources to do so in the past? Is, that's something right. that's being looked at? 
Yeah, it's a different story in that case. So um, it's no problem to um, send such an electron accelerator as, I, as we have them right now, as I shown a picture to Africa. You could do yeah. that. But the problem there is not really, um, the problem is not that um, uh, the affordability or so. The, the problem is really, can you operate them? So what happens if, a, if, some, I mean, if something fails? How, what do you do in case of um, power outages? What is if you can't provide them a, a, a very um, a clean environment and these kind of things? Okay. And so there are actually efforts in making um, uh, um, radiotherapy available in Africa in trying to make these things more modular. If something breaks, you can exchange it easier. That you don't require um, uh, the physicist expertise um, uh, to be to be on site. Yeah, and this is. Um, uh, this is a, a, a project which is currently being mainly driven by the UK. Okay. Uh, so. All right. No, it's a good answer. So we, we have a question from from Sean, and I'm just going to read the question, um, and we'll we'll see if it uh, is something you, you you feel able to answer. Can you tell us something about the development development of batteries from the nuclear science, as we have heard about from Tesla and others developing batteries? I'm, okay. I'm, um, uh, yeah, it's not really my um, my field. I'm not sure how this. Uh, uh, there are accelerators um, are in used for the um, uh, for uh, so, uh, for developing batteries. Uh huh. And this is mainly uh, we can look at the lithium chemistry. So in a way, this is something which is, which is done at uh, a Triumph. Yeah. So we are creating a um, radioactive isotope of lithium, and we can implant that in whatever um, material you want to study. And basically, it's lithium chemistry, which is relevant for the batteries. This is like a nuclear magnetic resonance technique, but instead of um, that we are polarizing the material itself we are looking in, we are bringing in the polarization from um, a beam which is accelerated, which is accelerated. So in a way, it's um, uh, yeah, we can do some of the uh, material science relevant for battery development with um, uh, particle accelerators. Okay, so the accelerator sure that answers the question. But so es essentially, the accelerator gives you a technique for studying the lithium chemistry within the battery, and of course, many batteries that we're dealing with now are rechargeable. They're based upon lithium. As, a, as, a, as an element used in them. And so essentially better lithium chemistry is a route to getting better batteries. Yeah, that basically summarizes very well. Okay, cool. Without so, going too much into the detail of this technique. No, I, you did a great answer. I actually had no idea about um, how they were used in that sense. You gave a, a very good sense of it. So what I might say now is in the absence of any further questions and before we thank our speaker again uh, at the end of the evening, let me just give you all a couple of quick um, uh, advertisements. First of all, and uh, I guess most importantly for our um, uh, talk that's coming up next week, uh, we will have a talk uh, next Tuesday, same time, same place, always going to be the same link. And uh, the title there is going to be Artificial Intelligence for Machine Vision. That's what you've got to look forward to uh, next Tuesday. Uh, if you want to see the evening's talk again, or if you want to recommend it to uh, friends and family, it will be, um, I should be having it on YouTube uh, within the next two or three days. That's kind of the time scale it takes me to, to get them up there. But uh, just search on UVic Cafe Sci, and that's where you'll see our archive of all talks. And uh, so I look forward to seeing you all again next Tuesday. And uh, with nothing else to do, let's just join us in raising your hands again to thank our speaker, Toby, for a wonderful talk. Thank you very much, Toby. Right, thank you. All right. And thanks very much to um, all of our audience members. I hope you enjoyed this evening's presentation. That concludes tonight's performance. OK. Uh, thank you for joining us. You can all now safely leave the meeting. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you very much. Bye.